and it gives me great pleasure to welcome Hans and, and over to you. Well, thank you. I'll see if I can share my screen. Um, that should be this one. Do you have it? Yeah, that's good. Good. So I would like to, to talk on behalf of the Amazon Tree Diversity Network. I saw that a few members uh, are already here. Welcome and, and thank you for being part of the network. And today I would like to talk about hyperdominance, hyperdiversity and hyperrarity. And I'll try to be not hyperactive and talk a little slow. Now the Amazon, oh, this doesn't work. I have to do like this. Yeah, the Amazon is a, is a very big forest. And this is the Rio Negro, about 300 kilometers north of Manaus. And the river here is about 15 kilometers wide. And there are some islands in between. So the forest is usually just a little green line at the edge of the water. And from, I, I boated from uh, Sao Gabriel de Cachoeira, which is the northern, the north part of the Rio Negro to Manaus, that is about uh, 1200 kilometers. And it takes uh, three nights and two days. And, and it just goes on like this, a very thin line of forest and very few people have entered the forest along this river. So in, in very few places, either botanical collections or ecolog ecological measurements have been made. And if you uh, look at the forest from above, this is from the, the Atto Tower close to Manaus, a, a tower of 325 meters high where they do lots of um, meteorological measurements. You see forest, forest, forest. And imagine you want to do a measurement here or here. It's, it's, uh, it takes some logistics and navigation to get to the spot where you want to be. So this is big, but then this is actually the area we would like to, to talk about, the, all of the forests of the Amazon. So it's a truly big area. And I always show my Netherlands. Uh, do you see my pointer, by the way? Uh, no, I don't think so. Oh, so yes, now, I got, yeah, now. Uh, now it is. So I have to I have to be in this screen. So this is the Ilha de Marajó. That's an island in the mouth of the Amazon. And then, oh, imagine this is the Netherlands. So I show always my my, my Dutch public that uh, this island in the mouth of the Amazon has the size of the country of the Netherlands, and the whole of the Amazon is about one hundred and thirty four times. Our country. And most of this is, is forest. So let's see at the major forest type. I'm going to run through the forest types, well, some of the forest types a bit. So here's terra firma. This is forest that is, uh, is never flooded uh, by rivers. It's about 82% of the Amazon. We have about uh, 1,345 plots in there, which is 64% of our plots. And we have recorded 4,704 tree species in those plots. Then we have forests along, uh, along rivers. This is a Varsia forest. So this is a forest that's flooded by relatively nutrient-rich uh, rivers. And this river here is actually dominated by Cecropia latiloba, a species that is very tolerant to flooding. You see the grass there at the, what you might consider the feet of the Cecropia, but that is uh, not actually the, the soil. The, the real soil layer is still five meters underwater here. And you can see there was another one, two meters uh, here where the water reached this year. Uh, Farsia covers about 7% of the Amazon, 14% of our plots in there, and we have recorded a little over 2,000 species in Farsia. Then along the rivers that drain the Crotonic Shields or, and the White Sand areas, you have much less nutrient-rich, no, actually you could say very nutrient-poor rivers, often blackwater rivers like the Rio Jaú here. And those uh, forests in Brazil are called Igapo forests. About 3% of the Amazon could be considered Igapo. About 9% of our plots are Igapo because the, our colleagues at, uh, at INPA from the Pelji Mao, they are specifically interested in floodplain forests. So they, do, uh, they have established <clears throat> many, many plots uh, in these areas. 
about 1612 species have been recorded in our plots. Then one of the forest types that I like most because I did my uh, MSC work in the white sand forest in Guyana are the white sand forests uh, in the Amazon here with an, a nice Aldina tree in front. And you can see this uh, Aldina as a tree that's very hospitable to epiphytes. So in these white sand forests, you find many, many, many epiphytes. These white sand forests cover about 5% uh, of the Amazon and about 6% of our plots are in, uh, in white sand forests and 1547 trees have been recorded by us. Then the last forest type I mentioned are the swamps, here a Mauritia swamp in Guyana. You can see the fan-shaped leaves of Mauritia. Mauritia is a very common species and can be extremely dominant in uh, some uh, uh, fans in close to the Andes where millions and millions of Mauritia grow close together. So the area of swamps is about 2%. 41% of our plots are in swamps, that is exactly 2%. And we have recorded 950 species there. So the Varsia, sorry, the, the terra firma forest is by far the richest forest. And there are two reasons for that. I made the species area curves for all of these uh, five forest types. So this is the species area, sorry, I have to move the point to you. This is the species area curve of the terra firma. And as you can see, the fact that we have so many plots in terra firma means that we also have many more species. But if we look at, let's say, 200 hectare, where we also have uh, Varsia forest here, the terra firma is still much higher. And in most, in all cases here, you can see the terra firma has for any uh, given area, the highest amount of uh, species, followed by Varsia, followed by Potsol, followed by Igapo, followed by swamps. We'll see a little example of this order later as well. So in 2003, and actually in 2000, the preparation started. In 2003, the Amazon Tree Diversity Network was sort of established. Uh, then, but maybe 50 people. At the moment, we have 206, if I'm correct. And each of the members of ATDN contributes plot data. And so at the moment, we have 1970 plots with composition and 2,200 and a few without composition, uh, well distributed across the Amazon. And, and this, this data is our tool to understand diversity, but also ecology of the Amazon forest. Starting in 2003, you could actually already see here, we, we, have, we, we, have, we prepare maps, which you can download from, uh, uh, from the downloads. Hey, that is interesting. It should be here. That is apparently an old, sorry, an old link of the file. So you can see, you can download this from our website. The, um, and this, this map is being updated continuously. I still have to do for 2021. But here are roughly 2,000 2, plots. Sorry, I go here, 2,000 plots. The bigger the dot, the higher the diversity expressed as Fischer's alpha, which is a measure that is relatively insensitive to sample size. So all the dots are the, the actual measurements on the, in the field and the green colors, which are one degree grid cell blocks, are the interpolation of the uh, Fischer's alpha diversity in, in the area. So in the plots, the Fischer's alpha ranges from four, which is a forest that is all, nearly dominant completely dominated by one uh, species, 2300, which is a plot with 600 individuals and close to 300 species. So you see that the highest diversity on average is found in Western Amazonia and then a little bit below the river and here in Central Amazonia, but also very high diversity has been uh, recorded in French Guyana. Now the method we use also allows us to prepare a map of, of errors. So you can see the, the, the errors here. So the darker the color, the less precise uh, our model is. So if you want to establish plots, then uh, here the area just south of the Guyanas and the, the areas really south of the Amazon River and, and the Andes are areas where plots uh, well, are needed or are welcome. What we find is that plots that 
are being um, uploaded to the system usually are within 10% of what the 10% error of what the map is uh, predicting. So the, the map has actually not changed very much uh, since the beginning. I must say that, of course, these areas with a few plots are also the least accessible areas. So what do we want to know with, uh, with this data? Here are a few questions, simple questions like how many trees occur in the Amazon? How many species occur in the Amazon? What is the geographic structure of all these species? What are their populations? Who is common? Who is rare? Can we figure out why that is so? Uh, what kind of traits do they have? What kind of functions do they have? What is the history of the Amazon? What's the evolution of these species? And what are the threats? So a simple question, how many trees, was not really answered in 2013 for this, this large area. And it's not very difficult. It's if you know the average density of trees per hectare and you know how many hectares the Amazon is, it's a simple equation of four with one unknown. So it's easily calculated. We did this a little bit uh, more uh, elaborate by calculating the density per one degree grid cell. And then, uh, so basically for each of these grid cells based on the plots that are close by and then summing for all of the Amazon to give us a number of roughly 394 billion trees. Let's call that 400 billion. So now this is, you can consider this a trivial number because it's so simple to calculate, but let's see what in, let's put this number here, 400 billion trees in the Amazon. And in 2013, what was the number of trees that was known or considered to be present at the world and used by governments and international organizations? That was this number, which means that almost all trees in the world occur in the Amazon, which of course is not true. So then the group of Crowther uh, was triggered to, to do a remeasurement of trees uh, of the world using an enormous uh, network of, uh, of plots, but largely concentrated in the, in the temperate areas. And the new estimate was almost 10 times as high. So a trivial measurement of the trees in the Amazon triggered the change of the trees in the world to be 10 times as high as it was. But this shows how little we sometimes know of our own world. And then you ask yourself, so how much do we actually know of the sea where these observations are far more difficult. Then from these uh, uh, 3,000 billion trees, about 10% occur in the Amazon. So let's see where our plots are. So this is a small sample of what can be considered the richest tropical rainforest on our globe. At the moment, our database holds 1,970 plots with composition. It has 5,058 species with a valid name. And 88% of our individuals are identified to one of those 5,000 plus uh, species names. The other 12%, almost all of them are, have been identified to genus. But for those, we still haven't figured out uh, what is the actual species name. Now, with all the calculations, do scale is a, is a challenge because nearly 2,000 plots is an enormous amount of work. It, uh, it actually started in the 30s. And, and plots have been uh, established ever since and at a fairly large rate now. So there are hundreds of men years in these plots. But if you look at Manaus here, so this is the city of Manaus at the confluence of the Rio Negro and the Solimois and then called Amazon afterwards in Brazil here, just north of Manaus is Reserva Duca. That's an area of 10 by 10 kilometers. And this area here could actually be seen as the total area that our plots would make up because that is 20 square kilometers. So, because these 2000 hectares are 20 square kilometers now. So this is all what we measured in the Amazon. Now have a look, keep an eye on Manaus. Can you still see it? So here it is. Just north of that is the little bit of forest of Reserva Duca. And in there is this 20 square kilometers, but we have it actually spread out over this enormous area. So our sample size is incredibly small. 
And that's a bit of a challenge. So then how do we dare to make an estimate of the total number of tree species in the Amazon? Let's first see how, how we do that. So we have this map of the tree densities across the Amazon. And for each of the species, we can make similar maps that show what is their percentage in the forest. So that's here. This is for the most common species in the Amazon. That's Ashwala de Coriacea. So the big dots tell us how much individuals in the plots or what percentage of individuals in the plots is made up by this species. And the gray is the interpolation of, uh, of these points. Now, if we multiply these two maps by grid cell and we sum them, we get here the total number of individuals for that species in the Amazon. And this works because many species like here Eshwara coriacea, here Iriacea deltoidea, a, a palm that is very common in Western Amazonia, uh, Protium altissimum, a species from more drier areas, and Epidua falcata, the tree that I climbed as an MSC, so that always has a, a, a place in my uh, my presentation because I like it so much. It's a strictly uh, Guayanan species. So many of these species have very nice and defined um, distributions. So this is the distribution. And here you can see all these red dots. These are all our plots, but the red dots have no presence of this species. So this is really confined. And many species can be uh, represented like this. So, now let's see what are the most abundant families based on our data. The first one is Febesi with uh, 48 billion individuals, followed by Palms, followed by Lecitidaceae, the Brazil nut family, followed by the uh, Sapota family, etc., etc. So um, these are the, the most common families. And then for those who like bot botany among us, these are the most species rich. In our plots, I must say, because if we look in the collections, it will change a little bit. But you see in, in trees over 10 centimeters, the Febesi are by far the most species rich family, followed by Loraceae at less than half of that. And then it, uh, then it goes down. So then the most abundant species. I have here uh, Eshwala de Coriacea, 16,000 individuals in our plots. It occurs in 930 plots, two plots, so that's more than half of the plots it occurs. And it has a population of 4 billion trees over 10 centimeters. So below 10 cent centimeters, there are probably similar amounts of individuals. Second one is Aeterpa precatoria, then it's Unocarpus, then it's Pseudomedia, and then it goes on. And then I all, always ask my audience, and that's a bit more difficult now since I'm talking to a screen, uh, what is uh, typical about the list of species that you see here? And then what is typical, if I take the non-palm species out, you see that six and before it was seven, but at the moment the, the, the ore has changed a little bit. Six species out of these most abundant species in the Amazon, are palms. And actually, in this, the top list of uh, species that make up uh, a lot, the 50% of the trees, these palms constitute five times more species than you would expect on the basis of the number of species that they have. So palms have an incredible ability of being extremely common. So how do we calculate? We've calculated this, uh, these uh, individuals for the, for the species, the populations. And here we plot all the populations of the 5,000 species we have. Mind you, this is a logarithmic um, axis. So this is 10 to the ninth. And then it decreases fast. And then it sort of uh, becomes a straight line. And then it drops off here. Here we have to deal, we are dealing actually with sampling problems. The red dots are the 95% confidence intervals for these estimates. So they are uh, relatively close. So we think this is a relatively accurate uh, prediction of the populations of these species in the Amazon. And here are the most common species. And you can see that most of the 95% confidence intervals are quite close to 
the estimates. Extend this figure. So we put it in a larger graph here. So here are the populations. And this here, this bar here is 50% of all the individuals of this graph here, up till here. Which means that 50% of, of all the individuals in the Amazon is just made up of by 227 species. So just 227 species make up 50% of all the individuals of trees over 10 centimeters in the Amazon. This looks quite small, of course, but <clears throat> again, remember that this is a, this is a logarithmic a graph. So what is here is really very high. Now, assuming that this is a log series, this the linear part should continue. And if we put it through until where there's only one individual per species or zero, that should be the estimate for the number of species in the Amazon. And that comes up to about 16,000. And we used an other method in 2013 to estimate from Fisher's Alpha from all of our plots. And that also came up to about 15,000. So the plot data suggested 15,000 and the estimated populations gave a, gave a similar estimate. If this is correct, then it means that 62% of all species in the Amazon have populations less than a million. And close to 6,000 species have populations in the Amazon less than 8,000. And that, according to IUCN standards, would make them immediately threatened species. Now, of course, you can ask yourself, are there really that many species in the Amazon? Are there 16,000 species in the Amazon? And how many of those species are known? It's at least a question that we asked ourselves. So we went into the data for, to see how the, the tree flora in the Amazon was discovered by botanists. And we actually also went with joint uh, expeditions with botanists to see how they work. So here is a, is a joint expedition to the Lely Mountains in Suriname with a group of botanists where we established uh, seven or eight plots and the botanists collected many, many species. And we did this on three uh, mountains in Suriname in, in consecutive years. And then we looked at all the collections that were made by botanists and have, have been aggregated in, in GBIF and in herbaria that are not part of GBIF yet, but are in the Amazon and gave us uh, access to their data. And what we found was about uh, a half a million unique collections of trees. And here you can see, uh, Easy. So this is the BR390 in Brazil. Uh, here's the, this is a river. Uh, here, French Guiana in the coast. This is actually French Guiana is the best uh, collected country by, by area. And after that, it's actually the three Guyanas together that are extremely well collected. And you can also see here there are areas, and those are also the areas where we have no plots, where there are very, very, very few collections. So think that half a million collections in an area of 5 million square kilometers is about one collection per 10 square kilometers. So also here, the collecting density is actually quite small. Still, if we look at the data, we see here are the number of collections that are made and here are the number of species. You see in the beginning, uh, everything went quite slow. Then it's after the 40s, it went up quite, quite fast. And at the moment, it is decreasing a little bit. This might be a real decrease, or this might be a delay at which specimens enter the databases of the herbarium. So I actually hope that it is still going strong. What we also see is that the efficiency of collecting decreases. So as you see that the number of species, uh, the number of individuals are going up and the number of species, but there is a slow decrease in the, in the rate at which it goes. So then you can make a graph on the number of collections that is needed to find one new species. And in the early days, that was nearly, uh, nearly one. Every, every species of every collection was a new species. Then it slowly started to decrease. And at the moment, you need about five to 500 to 700 new collections 
to find a new species uh, in the Amazon based on how it's being, it's being collected right now. Well, in this work, we found 11,676 names of trees that were collected in the Amazon. And we also calculated that if the collecting continues like this, it would take another 300 years if all the others were, were found. Now, this was a bit of an offense to some people because uh, ecologists don't know species very well. And we had made some errors. So within a year, uh, a group of taxonomists produced a new list, which they called a taxonomically verified species list. And they estimated that only 7,000, actually 6,727 trees uh, would be found in the Amazon. And then they also used a different uh, statistics to show that you could only expect 7,000 species uh, in the Amazon. Now, we did not agree with that. And I'll show you in, a, in, a, in the next slide why we did not agree with some of these things, but we, we still think based on all the errors that we corrected uh, based on this publication and uh, some, some new measurements that there are still over 10,000 species uh, in the Amazon and actually still close to 11,000. So where did, we, where did we agree? We Our polygon was actually a little bit too large. We, in, we included areas uh, that were not forest and were above 500 meters. And we had clearly non-Amazonian species in our list, some species from Asia and Madagascar that we uh, could not take out. Um, our synonymy could be in whose use improvement, but this was information that was often not available. But we found many non-Amazonian species in the Amazon. Those were species that are actually from, from other areas, but have been found and actually have been verified by, by taxonomists to occur in the Amazon. So this is a difference of opinion. If a uh, taxonomist they said that if you make a checklist, only the species that really belong to the area should be in, as an, and then as an ecologist would say, but you have spillover, you have species that, that immigrate into your system. And if you find them, they should be in the checklist because they are probably those rare species that you have. And there's bias because not all taxonomists agree on, uh, on species name. And then we also differed in the definition of what is a tree. So here, for instance, are some of the, the rare or hyper-rare species in the Amazon. Those are immigrants from Cerrado. Those are immigrants from the, from the Andes, like this species here. Uh, they could be lianas that occasionally occur as trees in our data. And of course, every time, uh, here's a new Vantania species from Fernkeyana, and here's a new Inga species from uh, Ecuador. Uh, species are being described all the time, so, and these are to, to usually to start with quite rare. We also have immigrants from lower size classes, so there are species that usually don't grow over 10 centimeters. Every now and then they do and are found in our plots. And of course, there are really rare Amazonian species, because if you would expect that most of the immigrants come from uh, systems that are around the Amazon, then you would find, think that most of the rare species occur along the edges, but that's not the case. There are many, many very rare species also in the center of the Amazon. And perhaps some of these species are maybe slowly disappearing from the system. Just checking my time. Okay, so is it 16,000? Is it 7,000? Or is it 11,000? Because Anatovo, using a different uh, distribution model calculated based on our data that you should expect 11,000 species in the Amazon. And this is her distribution. It's a, it's a log normal, no, sorry, it's a negative binomial distribution. And here's our log series. And you see there's, a, there's quite the difference between 16,000 and 11,000. And one difference is the number of rare species that you have in those samples. They are much less in this negative binomial. So how, how does that, what should we actually do? So in 20, 2020, we thought we should do a completely new assessment of the diversity and the richness using all different uh, models, distribution models that could be used, see which one fitted best, and then come up with a yeah, kind of a robust uh, estimation. So here is the 
species, the relative abundance distribution of our uh, 1970 plots. And then we fitted a log series, a negative binomial and a Poisson log normal. And the Poisson log normal here overestimates the, the common species very much. If we plot, plot it logarithmically, you can see that here, this is an enormous overestimation, but the log series and the negative binomial underestimate these a bit. You can see that the, the rare species here are kind of estimated similarly. So it's very difficult to, uh, to make a decision based on, on this kind of fitting. So we did many uh, tests and also made um, um, simulations of, of populations of species in the Amazon. So then the, the log series extension, which is the, the populations that we calculate and then pulling this line is one way. See here, this estimations that we made in 2013. This is estimations in 2013 with our new taxonomy. And this is the estimation of 2019. We did with approximate Bayesian computation where we calculated probabilities for the populations in a different way. We had the log series and then simply use Fisher's alpha to estimate. And then here we have the negative binomial. The negative binomial had some issues and produced fairly large errors. So what do you do? What one, which one to choose? So here we have the calculations. So the log series 16,000, the ABC nearly 16,000, log series 15,000 and the negative binomial 13,000. The Poisson log normal that had problems uh, with overestimating the common species only came to 6,000 and the non-parametric estimated Chow and all the other non-parametric estimators also were less than 6,000. Well, that is much less than the number of species that have been found in the Amazon already. So we uh, ignored them. And then to give a sort of a best guess estimate, we weighted the, the above bright ones and, and we weighted them. So we took an average weighted by the inverse of their standard error which gives an estimate of 15,835. So anywhere between 15 and 16,000, we think is still uh, a reasonable guess for the number of species of tree in the Amazon. So then let's see what happens when you sample that. So here is that, that rod. Here is a sample of 1 million trees from that relative abundance distribution. So here all species that are common are collected. And then here we have this sampling problem. So yes, no, yes, no. If we put them all together, we basically get something that looks like what we have in our data. And, but this is what you would expect if random sampling. And this is, this is our real data. So then the idea was that this might actually be clumping of, uh, of species. So this is uh, conspecific aggregations of species. And Paolo Prado, who uh, was the second author of, uh, of the 2020 paper, is an extremely good mathematician, uh, mathematic, mathematic ecologist. So he wrote several codes to include the, um, this conspecific aggregation in these samples. So then if we look at our sample here, the, the gray, and then we have a log series random sample, we have a log series clumped sample, we have a negative binomial random sample and a clumped sample. Then this random sample we don't have, we have a clumped sample. So this one fits well, the negative binomial with the random sample too, but we know that we don't have a, a random sample with clumped sample. So from this data and, and these calculations, we suggest that the log series with clumping is the best to, to fit to our data, which means that the we think the most accurate way of, uh, of depicting the populations of the three species in the Amazon would be a log series with clumping. And then this is, uh, this is how it should, should look like. And this is how it fits our data. Now, why do these uh, non-parametric estimators behave so badly? I want to show that because I, many, many people are still using non-parametric estimators, both on ecological data and on, um, on collecting data. 
So let's assume that the Fisher series is, is correct. It fits, fits our data quite well. Well, in this series, the number of species with n individuals is Fisher's alpha times x to the power n. So that would be one. If we look at the species with only one individual, divided by n, one. So x and x is the number of individuals that you have sampled divided number of individuals plus alpha. So if the number of individuals is fairly large, x is one, which means that the number of species with one individual is actually equal to alpha. So in a log series, the singletons are almost equal to Fisher's alpha. And then look at the Chow index as the estimated number of species is the observed number of species plus the number of singletons to the power two divided by twice the number of doubletons. It's based on sampling resampling. We don't do that. And it needs a large sampling effort. And I showed you that our sampling effort of the Amazon is actually ridiculously small. So then C, Fisher's alpha was this. So the number of singletons is alpha X. The number of doubletons is alpha divided by two. And this was the, the Chow index. So here we have the number of singletons and the number of doubletons. And if we substitute, then basically what we get is this is here, this is Fisher's alpha. So as estimated is the number of observed species plus Fisher's alpha always, which means that if you, at a certain time, if your sample size is big enough, Fisher's alpha is constant. So the number of singletons is constant. The number of doubletons is constant, so your Chow index is always the same. Which means that if you look at the observed species estimate, the observed species numbers, and you look at the estimated species numbers, then estimated is always alpha higher than the observed species number. So it's a redundant measure. It doesn't tell you anything. And here's that again. So this is the Chow index. This is the number of species estimated with Chow. And this is the number of species estimated with the log series. So if you suggest that the Chow index gives you a safe underestimate, I would say, well, look again at this figure because it's an enormous underestimate. It's just one third of what we think is really there. And it's 50% of what has been collected already. Now, what will happen if we make more plots? Because making more plots would be probably an answer to having better estimates. Well, here we have our 2013 updated estimate. Here we have our 2019 estimate. And then modeling with the Clunt log series with more and more and more plots. See if we have 20,000 plots. So that's 10 times the amount of plots we have now. Our plots will still only have a little over 7,000 species. So that is still less than half of the number of species that we think are in the Amazon. And now 20,000 is a lot, but it is still a tiny bit compared to the total Amazon. So the richness remains open to debates and the choice of the distribution that you make, so either a log series or an active binomial, uh, has consequences uh, for processes like immigration. Then if I still am allowed to say a few things, then the question is, uh, how do you become dominant as a tree? That is still a question. And I don't have a, a real answer for that. We've looked at dominance, we've looked at hyperdominance. And what we see is we look in the plots. So here's the dominance by plot. So here, this is the percentage of individuals of the most common species in the plot. And you see that in most cases, this is well below 20%. And in a very few cases, uh, the first species has more than 50 individuals of the plot, which is considered monodominant by us. And if you look at the dominance by species, see there are very, very few species that reach over 50 centimeters. And the majority of species, so it's way over 90%, never gets more than 20% of the individuals. And most of them, much, much, much less. So hyper rarity, is, uh, is actually the rule. So how to become hyperdominant? What we see is that hyperdominant species have larger ranges than all the other species together here. Again, this is a logarithmic uh, axis. So the difference from seven to six is actually a difference from 10 in the field. The hyperdominant species have fairly 
larger sizes than uh, the non-dominant species. And they also have much bigger populations, but that's of course, we have taken the, the, trend, the, the most common uh, species. So that's almost uh, a truism, but it is definitely a way of being very common. And how do they achieve that? Most of the, or many of the hyperdominant species are habitat specialists. So they occur mainly in, uh, in one or mostly two habitats in the Amazon. And you see that uh, this is the, these are the largest ranges, the large population sizes, close to 70% of those are habitat specialists. And where are they, where are they uh, hyperdominant and where are they specialist? Well, the dominance has something to do with the size of the forest type we are looking at. So here we have four different, uh, let's say, subbiomes. So we have swamp forest, white sand forest, floodplain forest, and terra firma. And here is the area they cover in the Amazon. So this is small and this is large. And here is the, the median dominance on those plots. So that is the most dominant species you find on the plot. Well, swamp forests have the highest dominance, which also relates to the lowest diversity. White sand forests have fairly high dominance, fairly low diversity. Floodplain forests are already less dominated and the least dominated forests are terra firma and they have also the highest diversity. So the, the size of the, of the area and the edaphic differences and the adaptations that you need to grow there determine, oh, sorry, this is my mouse, determine the total number of species in your system, but also the dominance of your system. So if you're adapted to grow in a, in a swamp forest, you have a higher chance of being a very dominant uh, species. So you'll find a higher percentage of, of hyperdominant species in these forest types. Now the take home message is that there are about 16,000 species of trees in the Amazon. The overwhelming majority is rare and Amazonians, that can be Amazonian rare species or vagrants. Uh, hyperdominants have large ranges, large populations and are habitat specific. Most dominant we find on small soil types and domesticated species. And I did not uh, include that in the talk because, I, because of time, but I'm saying it here. Also, people have had an influence in the Amazon as was shown by uh, Corina Levis in 2017, if I'm correct. And these domesticated species are five times more likely to be hyperdominant than expected by chance. And to give you a small look in the future, these are very small uh, letters, but there are, we have several plans for 2021 and we intend to publish many of these papers in biogeography traits and uh, phylogenies in one issue of a journal that we still have to find. And with that, I would like to thank all ATDN members uh, for their continuous uh, contribution to ATDN. And I want to thank you for your uh, uh, interest in the talk. And thank you. So here I would stop. Okay. Thank you, Hans. If you'd like to stop sharing your screen. Uh, yep. And I'll invite everyone to thank you as well. <laughs> uh, great talk. And I'd like to invite people to ask questions. Uh, hey, uh, Carlos. Uh, so there's one already in, in the chat, but feel free to either pop questions into the chat or raise your hand or wave your hand at me or whatever you, you, you want to do. So uh, D. Daly, you have a question there? Do you want to, to start? Okay. Yeah, I can read what I wrote there. This is, um, hold on a sec. I was saying there's uh, no question that there's a great deal of lumping and there's a great deal of cryptic diversity, but this includes some of the species heretofore considered hyperdominant. An example is Proteum altissima, which was recently discovered to comprise three distinct species, one each in the Sahabu, the uh, Western Southwest Amazonian and Amazonia and Central Eastern Amazonia. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Doug. It, it, uh, my daughter came in with a question and she persisted, so I had to say, sorry, go. 
I, I, sorry, I didn't hear your question completely. Can can you repeat, please? Uh, people in mind, they could also read it, of course, but uh, I was saying there's no question there's a great deal of lumping and there's a great deal of cryptic diversity. I agree completely. But this includes some of the species heretofore considered hyperdominant. So an example would be Proteum altissimum, which was recently discovered to comprise three distinct species, one each in the Cerrado, Western Southwestern Amazon, and the Central Eastern Amazon. So we have to ask you, I guess we're yeah. always going to have to keep adjusting. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. And uh, so that's very nice. And this is, uh, I also know that Symphonia globarifla is considered by the French Guyanese taxonomist as three different species, mm -hmm. even though the haplotype diversity of uh, ITS is, uh, is one. So it's, uh, these species are very similar. But if you look at the bark, I've, I've, I've seen a, a paper on that. If you look at the bark, the leaves, the fruits, then they look indeed quite different. And uh, yeah, also Ashwara coriacea is considered to be more than one species. So yes, and it's very problematic if that happens because if there's no material collected, we cannot split the, the data in the plot. So this is, uh, this is yes, this is real. And it's, and it's also a problem to, uh, to deal with. Um, so yeah. I think there will be many more species indeed included in some of our hyperdominant species. And it will pose problems with our yeah, next analyses. Very true, but please keep, keep describing new species. The more we know, the better it is. Okay, uh, while we're popping in uh, with the questions, I'll pop another one in. Uh, when you get to the low end of the population size, the very rare species, you've got a, a range of extrapolations that you applied there. Is there anything, any insight that we can get from minimum viable population size? And certainly some species may be on the way to extinction, but if, if uh, some of these populations are just naturally at a very low equilibrium, would that tend to curve down at the very low end in terms of, well, you simply couldn't have a viable population with 500 individuals, for example, uh, spread out thinly, rarely? <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's difficult to think what is a viable population size for trees, because they grow slow and we yeah, it's so I think that's difficult. I do know that there are certain species that have a very small range, but interestingly, I, th I thought about uh, writing a small paper about that based on our expeditions. And one nice example is, um, what is the name? It's, uh, it's a Podocarpaceae in from Acre. There is a... Uh, yeah, there's, there's one actually in Rondonia, which is uh, retrophyllum. Yeah. It's a podocarpaceae, which is... Yeah, it's re retrophyllum. 19th, yeah. And this was, so this was collected during the Hadam Brazil inventories. And then it came to, mm -hmm. uh, I think, uh, Museo Goldi. And they said, oh, but it's a new species. And then it took, I don't know how many US dollars to helicopter in and out to find it back. So that also means that probably <laughs> the, the locations of the Hadam Brazil plots were not that accurate. Um, so that, that this thing grew in, in Hondonia, and it is it's apparently very rare. Yeah. And then you think of uh, a species like Asterantos brasiliensis, which was only found in a few places. But now, if you see, it's it's actually found along the Rio Negro, from Venezuela to about six, seven hundred kilometers north of uh, of Manaus. So. If you probably if you find all the individuals, you will still get to a population of uh, maybe 10, 50,000, 100,000, maybe sure. even more. <clears throat> Another one is uh, Duchyodendron, which uh, was considered an endemic of Reserva Duca, but there have been uh, uh, thousands and thousands have been collected uh, or actually measured in, in trombetas. So it's it's very difficult to, to figure out what is a, a rare species. And I, do, I think if you see that we have collected half a million uh, unique collections out of the 400 billion trees that exist, exist in the Amazon that the real rare species probably have not been found yet. And it's a, imagine this sea of 400 billion trees and there's a, there's a species with a population size of 10 individuals. How are you ever gonna find it? Having said that, it is amazing to see how efficient botanists are to find species way outside their uh, the distribution range. So with, with these models, we, we make 
uh, estimations where the species should occur based on the on the population size and the abundance locally. But then sometimes they are found a thousand kilometers away by a botanist who walked and said, oh, this I haven't collected here yet. And then you have a species a thousand kilometers away from its range and, and it's a verified, verified name. So it's this is a real difficult question and very difficult to answer. If I could just interject very quickly, I'm sorry. Uh, we our next expedition uh, was uh, in Rondonia was was scheduled for the the Pacas Lobos River to to recollect <laughs> retrofilum, but we're going by we're going by canoe. Mm -hmm. That's very nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, any other questions? Sure, you have lots there. Uh, Terry, you have a question. Go ahead, Terry. Hands. Hi, Terry. Nice to see you. Yeah, you too, man. Great talk. Uh, I've got a really compromised speaker on my laptop and I'm sitting in an outdoor cafe, so I, I can barely hear you. But I just wanted to get your take on, you know, I'm looking at the ATDN map, uh, the plot map over greater Amazonia circa 2019. We had like 1,946 plots at that point. Maybe we have a few more now but there are still those sort of black box air geographic areas where there's no plot coverage. Southern, extreme Southern part of the Guianas, adjacent Northeastern Brazil, uh, Roraima in Brazil, et cetera. Do you feel like it's important to somehow start getting like plot-based coverage in those areas to really uh, fully expand our understanding really of what's going on? Well, the, the answer is yes, and the answer is uh, maybe not. I think, as yes, personally, I, I, it, it would be nice if we had plots all over. But I've also shown that even if you, uh, you multiply the number of plots by 10, which would be an incredible effort, we are still <laughs> yeah. asking the, what the number of species will be, and we will still not, we still will not have collected all of them. Those areas are, of course, uh, not covered very well because they're quite inaccessible. So if you yeah. come from the in Brazil and you go towards the border, you have to go up the Guiana Shield in several steps. So this is there are lots of rapids there, so it's difficult. The areas yeah. south of the of the Amazon River um, that are severely undercollected are also very difficult to to reach because you have a number of big rivers flowing towards the south, but you have very few bigger rivers going into these enormous interflues. So if, if you have to walk, you have to walk like in a floodplain of, uh, of 10, 12 kilometers, and then you go to an old Varsia of 50 kilometers, and then you go up. And yeah. there are very few people living there. And it's, so it's, it's really, really far. And some of these areas are also indigenous areas where you're not allowed to go. Yeah. Um, in the south of uh, the Amazon, it is also sometimes dangerous to go because you're not liked as a as a researcher because you're considered a conservationist. So there are reasons why some of the these places in the Amazon are just under collected, and and it would be nice to go there, but there's a, there's a price. And I see yeah. Carlos. And Carlos goes to several of these interflows. And um, we, we may have to talk, Carlos, because uh, I noticed you went to the, Jur was it the Jurua? Uh, you must say again. No, Carlos went to the, I think the Jurua. Yeah, and so we went to Serra do Divisor December before last. And we are going to get to lots of these remote areas and repeat about a hundred of these Hadam Brazil plots, but that's only going to add another hundred plots. Um, so it's nothing like the scale that Hans is talking about. Yeah. Now the thing is, of course, if you if you believe in the statistics, it doesn't make a difference if you have two thousand plots or twenty thousand plots, because with twenty thousand plots, you're still only at seven thousand species. I think the the errors will be less. But then maybe you say, oh, well, they were wrong in uh, 2013. It's not 16,000, it's uh, 15,500, or maybe it's 17,000 species. But it will still be an estimate then. Yes, sir. We're just dealing with a, 
an area that is so incredibly large and so incredibly rich and things are so incredibly rare. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Chet? Cool, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. That was just a wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I, I was interested that in your finding that you had, um, you had the, the most hyperdominance in the low diversity communities. Um, and then when you got out to the terra firm forest, which is of course super diverse, you had much more evenness. And and now, admittedly, it's been a long time since I've read, you know, Hubble's neutral theory and Preston's canonical log normal and all that. But my my recollection, at least, is that that's essentially inevitable. That you essentially can only find that you always find more hyperdominance, less evenness in low diversity communities. So I guess my question is, have you ever, have you ever found an exception to that? Are there any, are there ever communities that are very low diversity, but where the, the rank abundance is still quite even and you don't get that hyperdominance? Um, not in the way we have subdivided the Amazon. Then we, we always find uh, this, this kind of uh, distribution. What I find interesting about these, um, Fact that these small areas have the, the lowest uh, diversity and, and so the highest dominance is that some of them are extremely poor and people have related their species poorness on the nutrient poorness and others like the varzias have the highest productivity so you cannot really say that they have few species because they are so nutrient poor they're actually quite nutrient rich so i think this area is indeed uh, why these these systems uh, are poor in species and yeah, then you have more dominance. But mind you that so many of these palms grow in uh, dominate in swamps, but the, the species with the highest uh, number of individuals is a terra firma species. So there's, that's the other way of getting hyperdominant. It just occurs in 55% of our plots. It's just in the central part of the Amazon because it doesn't really grow a lot in the northern part and the southern part. In the central part of the Amazon, it's just everywhere. But that's another way of becoming one of these hyperdominants. Unless, of course, Dirk splits them. Then all of a sudden, that's interesting. That's very interesting. If a species is being split, then it all, all of a sudden it just tumbles down to the mid-range of the, of the relative abundance distribution. So that would be interesting to see. Thank you. Okay, I'll ask a question. Uh, I have a question about small trees. You mentioned in one of your slides I'm going to throw a throwaway line of immigrants from smaller size classes. And if your, uh, so, uh, your, and your plot threshold is 10 centimeters dBH, I presume, typically. Uh, and how many species do you think of tree-like form are there that never make it above 10 centimeters? If you looked at all tree-like forms of the Amazon. Uh, oh, I don't know the number, there? but I do know that in a few weeks, a paper fairly Draper will appear where the where uh, it's being, this, this, these smaller size classes are being examined. So this is from two and a half all the way up to the biggest trees. And then you see that there are quite a few species that never make it up to 10 centimeters. And then there's also really phy phylogenetic filtering if you go up to the, the larger size class. So just a few clades make it up to the, the really top. If you look at, uh, and if you look at the botanical collections, and you also see quite a large difference in what we have in the plots. And it also has to do with that the small things are easier collected. So in the, let's say, Hertella racemosa, which makes it up to 10 centimeters every now and then, is quite poor in, in our plot data, but is the most uh, collected tree in the, in the Amazon, in herbaria. So all these things, uh, all these things count. What we also found with the collection data is that things that have bright uh, flowers, uh, you find many more flower collections. And if the fruits are very well visible, then you find many more fruits uh, collected. So all of these things uh, play a role in, in how you sample. Mm. Did you have a sense of, of small trees? Is that a, a significant increase in the number, total number of trees in the Amazon? Oh, oh. I don't know if, I don't know, I don't know if Freddie is here. If not, I guess it, not. it was it was a sizable uh, amount of new species. I can tell you, really. 
Okay. Okay, Michelle, you have a question? Yes, thank you very much. Um, thanks, Hans, for giving such a wonderful presentation. Um, I was just wondering if, uh, because of the data efficiency uh, within certain areas or region, for example, in some of the Guyanas or in, um, in Brazil, I wondered if you've considered like using remote sensing data. So, so for example, Hyperion um, has a large range of um, sort of reflectance wavelengths data that we could use uh, to sort of identify tree species uh, using their spectral signatures. And I wonder if uh, you've sort of considered potentially using that and that could potentially capture as well all these different um, sort of size classes um, across uh, the region. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, technology goes fast. If you would have said in uh, in 1980 that you could walk in the Amazon with a with a small thing like this and and know exactly where you are and then make pictures and you know you see what you can do with a phone nowadays. It's it's amazing. So maybe, but uh, there have been several uh, talks about being cap being capable of identifying tree species from uh, uh, remote sensing. But I've never seen a paper where in one plot everything could be identified simply from the traits. I've seen a, a study here in Europe with two oak species and in the, in the lab, lab it works well, but then you go to the field and then the soil changes, the water level changes the leaves. So even with two species in the field, it can be difficult. So personally, I think identifying species from the air is a long way off, but I may be completely wrong. But personally, I don't think I will see it. This is really everything. Eh? I mean, some species, yes, but really being capable of identi identifying all 16,000 tree species from the air, I think that is really, really a long way off. Maybe a middle ground is some of the your hyperdominance, which some have quite distinct traits. Some of those Maybe, but if you have a sibling species that's not hyperdominant, but and in terms of its traits, it's uh, relatively similar, then I'm still wondering if you can uh, if you can distinguish the two, because the traits may not be in the leaves. See, one of the things I didn't mention, one of the things that we have to know about uh, hyperdominant species is that they can deal with uh, fungi and bacteria quite well. They must be very uh, good in dealing with frequency dependent mortality because otherwise they simply could not be so common. So they may just have a better immune system than uh, the species that are not hyperdominant. And then of course they run the risk that one day, just like the, uh, the American chestnut, that was the most common species in the eastern US, and then in, two, I think, 1911, if I'm correct, the chestnut blight arrived in, uh, in, in the US, and then in about 20, 30 years, it was done. And this might easily happen to one of the hyperdominants one day. There may be a fungus, and either we as humans bring it in, or something evolves, and then a hyperdominant like Mauritia flexuosa that grows with millions and millions on the pistaza fan, maybe done in 50 years. But for now, you can say that these hyperdominants, one of the traits that they must possess is a good immune system. Okay, thank you. Any more questions, uh, Nkani? Hi, yeah, thank you. Um, well, thanks Hans for the talk, it's been terrific. And uh, because you mentioned Mauritia, I need to ask uh, one question. Um, so you, you, you mentioned in your talk that the hyperdominants are normally found or can be easily found in as, as a specific to certain habitats. But then also uh, you, we have the palms family, which are representative of many hyperdominants and most of these species from the palm family are not that specific. So what do you think, do you think is it trade based is the thing is an anthropogenic influence so you think what's the i mean in terms of mauritia yeah mauritia can be in what look um soils but in terms of habitat specificity you can find it in a wide variety of environments so how do you balance this habitat specific with the epidominance in, in in some families like palms well the habitat specificity is is calculated 
as uh, as how many individuals it has in in total and how many of that occur in one habitat. So it's a statistical measure. It's not absolute because nothing is absolute. Endemics in that sense don't exist because things can always escape. So the a large percentage of the Mauritia, I would say probably over 90% occur in very wet areas. And many of the Mauritias in the Amazon occur along along uh, along streams in uh, in PT areas and in and outside the Amazon they also occur in uh, in savanna if you have uh, lots of flooding um, so but they of course they can they can grow outside their area uh, I mean we have uh, many white sand species and for instance if I look at Epirua falcata which is probably the most common species in the Guyanas it is a real white sand indicator so in the center part of Guyana, where I, where I worked 10 years, I think 95 or 98 percent of all the individuals that we measured grow on white sand. And if you have white sand, you find a species. If you find a species, you have a 98 percent chance of being on white sand. Then in these bauxite hills where we worked in Suriname, there is nothing really uh, super common. But when we put all the plots together, all of a sudden we realized that Epirua falcata is the most common species on these bauxite hills. In, in Suriname, it also occurs very abundantly in white sands, but then if you go further to French Guiana, there are many white sand areas where you have no Epirua falcata, and it actually occurs on the schist soils. So you have an indicator species in Guyana, and then when you move towards the east, all this indicator behavior sort of disappears. So, and then in French Guiana, they also show that the populations that grow along the rivers and grow on the, the high hills, they do exchange some, uh, some genes. So there is pollination, cross pollinations, but somehow the juveniles don't make it. So in the, you find it in juveniles, mixed individuals from the top and the bottom populations, but they never make it to the stepling stage. So maybe you, you see sort of uh, speciation already beginning. And this is, this is a problem with plants. Um, we, 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 we like to, to describe them as species, but it's a very fluid, in many groups, it's a very fluid concept. But then it's, if, you, if you take it as a fluid concept and say everything is a swarm of DNA and you know, we will just work with that, it becomes really vague and difficult. But species are very plastic, that's for sure. Okay, thank you. Okay, any more questions? Oh, we have one from uh, Hannah. I have a question. Oh, okay, Ben, Ben, Hi, Hi, Hans. Uh, Hi, Ben, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Very nice talk, enjoy a lot. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I have a, a question about uh, um, the conservation a question of conservation of species. Uh, I, I live in Southern Amazonia. Uh, now I live in, in the middle of soybean and pastures. But some, some people uh, ask sometimes if we, we are losing species, we don't even know what difference does it makes. Uh, we, we, well, well uh, my answer is uh, we may it may be losing ecosystem services precisely because common species are also disappearing from parts of, of Amazonia. We are losing at the same time uh, the, the key, because we have in, in this common species, uh, very important key species for ecosystem functioning. For example, uh, of temperature and rainfall production. Uh, what, what do you think about that? Because hyperdominance is very important uh, also as a, a question of conservation in Amazon. Yeah, that's difficult. The last part uh, somehow didn't come through here. I don't know if it was the line here or there, um, but I think that in terms of services, uh, the hyperdominance provide a lot of services, but rare species may provide services that are very essential, like, like keystone species that are rare. And we, if you have 16,000 species, it's quite difficult to know what each of these species can contribute. So if rare species contribute a lot, 
they are equally important. Um, what I think is at the moment most, most pressing, because if you have large areas of forest, you also preserve large uh, numbers of species. But I think what is really important is to, to, to see that if you cut too much forest, that the, 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 water, the water cycle in the Amazon is changing a lot. And that will eventually also affect the soil, uh, the soil growth just south of the Amazon. So if we stop this enormous uh, highway of water that's going, going from the east to the west, then in, at a certain time, we'll have lots of droughts in Bolivia and, uh, and the areas like Hondonia and Acre, where all these soil plantations are, and, and agriculture will simply be impossible. So I think it's not only the, the, those really particular functions, but the, fu the function of the whole forest as buffering the climate is, is quite important for the area. It's just, just to respond to that, I and mean, I think that, that is an argument for the presence of forest, but you could argue yeah. that it's quite a weak argument for the presence of diversity, and you could have a few tree species providing that water function. And this is always some, some concern I always have around ecosystem service arguments for nature, that uh, you can actually provide a lot of those services with very little biodiversity. Uh, and uh, you know, perhaps it's, a, it's a, obviously redundancy comes in and, and there are functions there, but it can always be a hazard of saying that these services are the reason why we need to protect nature, the benefits they provide to us. Yeah, that's true. But I think uh, that each species uh, may have something that uh, we can use later on. So I, I think by losing species, we lose opportunities and, and maybe we'll lose some very interesting opportunities. So it's, it's a pity to, to lose species simply because of that. And of course, you can live without the forest. I mean, we, if in the Netherlands we say we go to nature, we go actually to agricultural lands, and then the, the edges of the meadows have a few wild plants, and we have uh, our uh, godwits uh, flying around, which is a national bird, which is actually not a natural bird. It's, it's a bird of the, of the peat bogs of the north. But, so, but this is nature for us. So you can live without forest, uh, of, but if you have some green, but I think the, the Amazon is of vital importance for, for climate because it's so big. And the, the thing is, if we, if we step across a certain uh, border, may, boundary, maybe it's very difficult to get back. Okay, right. thank, uh, thank, thank you, Ben. Uh, so we have a question from Vito. Do you want to raise your question? Uh, hi, Hans. Hi, everyone. Oh, just to read you what I, I put in the chat. Uh, of course, it's always good to see your presentations, Hans. Uh, a lot of passion, and you, we can really feel that you put your, all your energy on that, on Amazon. And uh, thank you for that, of course. And I would like to ask you, what's next for ATDN? How could you keep digging into Amazonian tree species ecology, diversity, and distribution? Well, the, 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 the sort of list that I provided and then switched off <laughs> quickly gives some answers. Uh, biogeography, phylogeny, phylogeny and traits, uh, traits and forest functioning. Those are things that we would like to, to tackle this year. And then indeed after that, we, we just have to sit yeah. down and say, okay, what, what else do we need to know? What would we like to know? And maybe start become more uh, uh, going into the conservation debates. Um, but it's a good question. And uh, I've been running ATDN for, uh, for 20 years now. And so I was talking with, uh, with Frans Bons yesterday, who said, well, you have to think about the time when you have to hand it over. So maybe that's also something uh, we should think about. And all I see many people of, uh, of ATDN. I see Michel, I see Terry, I see you, Vitor, I see Ben Hur, I saw. I see William. Hello. <laughs> I saw uh, uh, Carolina. So there are many people, many young people. So at a certain time, maybe one of the younger ones has to take over. And then I, uh, because I, shockingly, I noted that uh, in in my uh, personal file it says to be retired soon. So who knows? <laughs> felt felt a bit pain in the heart. I must say, I thought I was young. <laughs> 
gynecologists never retire. They just keep going. <laughs> they fall over. Well, taxonomists even less. So I'm, I'm working in a taxonomy. Maybe I can, I can become a taxonomist. I'm actually doing a little taxonomy of the of Eperua. And it's, it's fun. I, I tackled a, a small uh, genus with only 18 species. I can handle that. And then maybe after that, who knows? Great. Uh, Okay, I think Emilio has a question, but yes, the microphone isn't working, so I'll, I'll read it out. Uh, by the next steps, what, what can we do about those places where access is difficult, like the mining arc of the Orinoco in Venezuela, where I've been working for many years now? Is there a role for herbariums and other independent collections for these areas? Maybe I think they face the same problems, because going there for to collect uh, herbarium specimens or set plots is, you'll face the same difficulties. Um, I think the, the local herbaria may have uh, easier access, but then you see the, there are many, many, many collections in, um, in Impa and Museo Goldi, but they're also mainly concentrated in the areas that are accessible. And they are, they are accessible for a reason, and the inaccessible areas are inaccessible for a reason. So you must somehow deal with those reasons, and some are, are logistic and some are more political, and some can be solved. But there'll be a cost to it. And I think there's also, if you see, um, if you look at the funding in, in Brazil, most of the funding goes to uh, the Atlantic forest areas and only 2% of the research funding goes to the Amazon. So there is just little funding available. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, William, you have a question? Yes. Hey, Hans. Great talk. It was fantastic. Really fascinating always, you know, learn more about the Amazon. So I have a, a curiosity. It's um, so with it, with this all information from the ATDM plots, will you be able to suggest which species are at the risk of extinction? Well, we, we looked at that in 2015 by seeing how um, deforestation may have influenced uh, species in, in areas. So using the same methodology of, of having a map with uh, all the trees and then the populations and then the, the amount of area that has been deforested, we can estimate what percentage of, the, of each species has gone by deforestation. And at the moment in 2013, that was still relatively small. And then it depends on the scenarios you use, uh, business as usual scenario for the 90s, which was actually in, the, in, in 2013, was, it was going much better. Deforestation was going down. I think now with the current government, you can be less assured that, uh, that it will be going well. The deforestation is going up and it's uh, relatively uncontrolled. And then what is going is mainly the forest in Hondonia, Acre, Pará. So the, the, this, this, this arc of deforestation, so species that have their, their main focus of their distribution in that area have the highest risk. Then on top of that, Vitor uh, wrote a paper, he, co he major authored a paper on how climate change would affect that. And I thought that deforestation was much more important than, than climate change because temperatures are already high and they get a little higher, but many trees can handle that. But then it also gets a lot drier. And then, then he showed that, that this, this climate change actually affects the Amazon even stronger. And of course, this is a slow process because trees live a long time. But it, it could mean that uh, certain areas lose 50% of their species in time. So, and again, the, the highest uh, problems are in the arc of deforestation, which are also the areas that will become the driest. So the, in, in his paper, he showed that in the end, the, if, if everything goes wrong, so if we can't keep the CO2 down and go to four and a half uh, degrees warming, if we don't stop deforestation, the southern part of the Amazon in 2050 may look like the Atlantic forest where most of the forest is gone and the forest is in fragments. But people go into these fragments when fire goes into the fragments. Hunting is, uh, is a lot. So you also have that effect that big animals go. So that means that the dispersal of many uh, hardwood species becomes also more problematic. 
So then these forests deteriorate more and more. And then the only forests that uh, will still be relatively intact would be Western Amazonia, but still because of climate change with less species. And uh, the center to the southern part of the Guianas and, and Amacayaco area in Brazil. So you have basically a completely deteriorated piece of the Amazon in the south and a slightly intact forest in the north. That would be the doom scenario. And so everything that occurs in this southern part of the Amazon would be uh, in risk of, of complete yeah, extinction or near extinction. Extinction is really difficult to, uh, to determine because one tree might just still be around for another 100 years or 200 years or 300 years, and then it's still not extinct, but you could say ecologically extinct. Does that answer your question, William? Yes, it does. Thank you, Hans. Thanks. OK. Uh, and uh, Juliana, you have a question? No? Yeah, I have a question. Hi, Hans. It's great to see Good you. you. Great to see you. Good uh, to see you. I have a question. Um, I was thinking like with all the discoveries and reclassifications that we are seeing recently, if we do the map of diversity in 50 years from now, to what extent, to, to what extent do you think this map would change? Like thinking of the map of the nature paper that you have like back in 2004, you know, the gradient with the so that changed with the soil and also the map, the gradient of diversity. If you do it in 50 years from now, with all the advances in taxonomic knowledge that we have, how much do you think it would change? You mean in terms of the data we have or in terms of the climate? In terms of the data. Suppose the climate is kind of don't change so much. <laughs> uh, I think diversity will not change much. I mean, it, it will go up because more species will be described. So also sometimes so in some of our plots, there will be like two protein altissimum rather than one, or maybe even two uh, Eswaria coriaceas. And then problematically speaking, Eswaria coriacea also uh, hybridizes with several other uh, Eswaria in central Amazon. So how do, you, how do you deal with that? If you know everything, probably diversity will go up, but I have no idea to what, to what extent that will be in the plots. I would imagine that it will not be more than 10%. But then maybe I'm wrong. Maybe many species will be split in different species. I know that in terms of birds, Daniel cohn haft says that the number of bird species in the Amazon might be twice or three times as high as we think, because all these species have dialects, and all the ones that have dialects should actually be considered different species. So maybe, maybe we'll have three times as much as many species in our plots when it's completely sorted out. But that's not the current status. And so we have to work with the data we have now. And then uh, maybe, I mean, we look at, uh, let's say, 1900 and, and think, hmm, they didn't know that much. Maybe in 2050 or 2100, they'll look at our papers and say, hmm, that was uh, not that good. Maybe. OK, great. And Jesus, I think you have a question. Uh, hi, Hans. A pretty cool presentation. Um, uh, it, it seems that it's kind of a mess sometimes when you talk about the, the taxonomy of the species and, and all these papers that have come out, like after your paper as well, like discussing these issues. But I also know that probably you are also taking another way also to for identification. Uh, do you have any updates about this uh, DNA barcoding program that you were kind of starting to develop? Yeah, we, we had an idea to barcode all the 10,000 species that were known. Uh, and we used uh, genome skimming. And there were a few problems. The problem was, one, one problem was funding. We needed about 8 to 10, to 10 million and spoke with a few big financiers who were interested, but in the end didn't finance. There were also some uh, political problems in Brazil. So the Brazilian uh, Ministry of Science at a certain time did not want to back it, which meant that some of the Brazilian institutions had to step out. And then finally, 
the method we were using, the genome skimming that was sort of developed by the Copenhagen uh, participants was much more difficult than we thought. So we, I skimmed, for instance, all the Eperuas and then tried to see if we could get this, this DNA mark to work. But the problem is if you do a skimming, you, you basically look at all the, the DNA. So you have the fungi, the metazoa, and the bacteria in the leaves, and then you have to take them out first. And in some cases, the Eperua leaves had only one and a half percent uh, Eperua DNA, and there was 98 uh, um, Pseudomonas DNA. So they have to filter that out. So the, the, finally, the bioinformatics become quite complicated, which means that it's not so useful as a simple technique. So in the end, what at least what I could get out of the, the DNA bar, out of the skim is very good uh, ITS uh, data, actually the whole nuclear ribosomal. So it helps very well solving the phylogeny of Eperua. But as a barcode, I think it's too expensive and too labor intensive. So the, at, at the moment, most taxonomists are sort of changing to uh, hybridizing sequencing, HypeSec, which, uh, which you take about 500 regions. And then maybe one day one of these regions will prove to be a very good barcode. Or maybe you know the family and it's okay, in this family, this barcode is good. In that clay, that barcode is good. Which means that you need a bit of information about your species, about your sample. And then you can do more targeted barcoding uh, from that. Maybe a standard barcode for all plants is not going to work. Cool, thanks, Anne. Okay, uh, there's a few more questions, but I think we're on 5.30 now, so I might draw a close and give hands a break uh, uh, at this stage. So uh, we have a tradition uh, in this uh, to, to unmute any seminars at the end, so everybody can give a, an audible round of applause to the speaker, just like in the old days. So, so I encourage you to unmute and, and <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much for your retire hands. Not gonna happen. We need you. <laughs> if the dogs are joining in, I hear. Okay. I'll stay still another six years for sure. <laughs> she supports she supports the idea. Another Sixty years? Was that what I heard? <laughs> what do you hear? <laughs> But thanks for a terrific talk. Uh, this is recorded and we'll post it onto YouTube and I'll send a link to Han so you can share it around the okay. Nice. Network as well. Awesome. Okay. Let me, let me again thank all the members of ATDN that are here, but also those that are not here. You have a tremendous support. And think, remember, all members, you, you can write papers, do write papers, as many yeah. as you can. The data is here, it's just waiting. Yep. But thank you all for, uh, for your support. Thank you all for being here. And let's hope that we can come to the and go to the Amazon uh, soon. Yes. I wish you all uh, health and safety and hope to see you soon. Yes, sir. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Maria. Bye. 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 Hans. Bye. Bye. Sorry. Ciao. Ciao. Adiós.